so today, just give a brief talk, 45 minutes, about Twitter's international approach. We have a kind of a different model than you might be expecting if you're a localization or internationalization uh, specialist. And actually, can I get a show of hands? Who in the audience right now does this kind of work for the company or have, has done this work in the past? All right, awesome. Cool, love to see that. Make things more international, yes. One of Twitter's core values actually is to reach every person on the planet. And uh, we've tried to do that through launching a number of languages. We just launched right to left languages, uh, Hindi, Farsi, Arabic, and Urdu on Twitter.com. And if you go and switch your language to those right to left languages, you'll notice that the whole display flips around. So localization, internationalization at heavy play there. And uh, very interesting challenge. So let me uh, introduce myself. My name is Cameron Dutro. I do work on Twitter's international team. And uh, my username is at Cameratron. Follow me on Twitter. Now, internationalization, just in case there are people in the audience that don't know, internationalization and localization are two different sides uh, to the same problem, really. We call the overarching, uh, the overarching term is called globalization. Under that is both I18N and L10N. Um, we all know what happens when localization doesn't go so well. You get things like this. And it might be hard to read. It says, please use the escalator on your behind. That's, you know, <laughs> it's not a great translation. Or you get something like this. You know, I mean, obviously that's not what they wanted to say. So that's localization. Localization just means translating text and hopefully doing it well. The other side of the coin would be internationalization. And internationalization is kind of everything else, to me anyway. This is kind of an example of internationalization. I imagine these guys to be, you know, Chinese or something, and they're trying to do YMCA, but obviously they have no social context for that because YMCA is something that's only done in the United States. So that's why I call internationalization everything else. Dates, times, plurals, everything you'd need to make your site 100% international ready. So we do call those, there's the abbreviations I-18N for internationalization because there are 18 letters between the I and the N and L-10N or LION because there are 10 letters between the L and the N there too. And again, that's just under the umbrella of globalization. So fortunately and unfortunately, Rails provides ways to do this, to ways to internationalize or ways to localize your app. I should really say they provide ways to, inter to localize but not to internationalize. So we'll go over just the basics of how this is done usually kind of by default in Rails. The first thing you have is the uh, I18N gem. I18N gem provides a lot of functionality for localization. You can wrap uh, phrases or strings, really just YAML, uh, dot YAML notation in the T function. It'll go back to a YAML file, pull the translation, and stick it into your, into your ERB or JavaScript. Actually, that's not true, just your ERB, uh, and that's how you get localized content. So the I18N gem provides multiple backends. It's get text compatible. Uh, but it is kind of slow, and you can only use it in Ruby. There's no way to use this in JavaScript. There's not really any way to use it in any other language that you want to support. Uh, so I did discuss YAML files. There's also this concept of PO files, uh, which are machine readable. They're compact. They're great, but they're not in line. You have to externalize all of your strings and use this dot notation that I'll show you in a second. Uh, and I personally find them to be inconvenient. Uh, and certainly not web friendly. I mean, when was the last time you saw somebody parse YAML in JavaScript? Probably never, right? So here's an example of how this might work, visually speaking. You've got en.yaml for English. And you have a message in here, my fancy message. And you might have this translation in Spanish. And that's going to be hola instead of hello. And then you'd access that in your templates by simply saying my.fancy.message, which is going to go back through that YAML tree and pick out that sentence or that phrase. Twitter, however, thinks we, I should say, think that that's not the most optimal way of doing this. Provides, you know, some content, some, some, um, some techniques, but really not kind of the scalable way that we'd like to see. Uh, it means that you have to externalize every single string. You have to go take those to a translator. The translator has to manually change that YAML file, which means they have to understand how YAML works and they also don't really get much context around what the phrases are where. So we have a different strategy for this. Uh, and be, 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 be advised, this is not necessarily the strategy 
that you will want to do for your own apps, it depends on the size. We instead of doing these YAML files, we have uh, something called the Translation Center. Has anybody in the audience used the Translation Center before? Be translate.twttr.com? Nobody. Okay. So I'll introduce you to it. We also use JSON as an interchange format because that's so much easily, so much more easily understood by, J uh, by JavaScript. So the Translation Center is a full localization solution. We make use of volunteers for it. It's crowdsourced. And it provides, because of that JSON exchange format, we're able to support a lot more languages in general. A lot of parsers exist for Java, Java well, JavaScript doesn't even need a parser, and then of course for Ruby. Translation Center looks like this. Here's the home page. And I know it's a little hard to see on these screens here, but you've got projects in the middle there. And projects are ways of grouping strings. Strings are also organized by tags within projects. That's not really important though. Just know that this is the center for all the localization that happens at Twitter. You can see on the screen we have Twitter.com, Twitter for Android, Twitter for iPhone. All those products are managed, the localization for them is managed through the Translation Center. Currently, Translation Center has about 550,000 uh, volunteer translators in 28 languages, uh, 27 if you don't include English. We have 16,000 active phrases, which means phrases that are currently in use, pulled from all of the projects that we have across the company. And there are close to one and a half million translations, not all of which are good translations, and so we only have 300,000 approved translations. And we'll go into more details of what approval means in a second here. So there's this process for how strings are dealt with in all of our code bases. There's different processes, but for our Rails apps, we usually run uh, a static analysis tool which extracts phrases from the code base then imports them into the translation center. That would be the jobs of our engineers using tools that the I18N team has built. Then we can organize those strings by project and by tag. They're presented to translators who then translate them. There's a series of moderators which choose the good phrases from the bad phrases and uh, approve the phrases that we want on the site. They're always multilingual and we hand pick them from the translators we've had uh, in the, in the few, it's kind of when there weren't any moderators, we looked at which translators were doing the best work and selected moderators from that group of, of awesome people. Uh, so there's the moderation step. And then of course there's the export step into that JSON format that's then used on Twitter.com. So you might be wondering, so we, we do do inline uh, translations, so that means that translations are only in the source code, they're not in any external files. We do that code analysis, that's that, um, static analysis to pull translations out or uh, phrases out, and you'll hear a lot of people tell you that's not the way you should do it. You should have these external files, you should have pull files, you should have YAML files, and the people will tell you all across the internationalization world that that's what you, sh you should really be doing. I disagree with that. I think that's ridiculous. You can't see what's going on in your source code. You might see a phrase like my fancy message. You have no idea what that actually says. There's no way to tell you that that actually says hello. You could name it something better than my fancy message, but you get the idea. Uh, we also might wonder how we support context in the Translation Center because having strings in line for context is really not that much better than using that YAML dot notation. We do provide a number of different ways uh, for our translators to get context for strings. Uh, one of those would be comments. So we provide the ability for each translation, each phrase to be tagged with a comment, as you might see here. So this says followed you and there's a comment underneath uh, that says the title, uh, title on the list of users that followed uh, the user. We also have automated screenshots using something called Birdshot that we developed. So this is presented to uh, translators when they click on a special button. It pops up with a translation uh, in line in the page. So this is showing the string that says find out what's happening right now with the people and organizations you care about. You can see that it's actually outlined with a red outline. So they can click on this and say, yep, that's exactly where that phrase appears on Twitter.com on the logged out homepage right where that feature image is. We also provide a couple of, of uh, interesting hints and things in, uh, in our templates uh, for things like this problem in French. So in French, followers, apparently, I don't speak French, but this is what I'm told, followers and abonné is translated the same way in, uh, in English, or is the same way English word, and so oftentimes the translation gets messed up on Twitter.com. So we provide something called a translation hint that says this is the kind of context we're expecting here, so we use this word instead of this word, and we end up getting abonné. We also, to increase kind of our translator 
uh, efficacy and uh, their, their overall motivation, we provide a lot of incentives. And this is really important. We feel like building a community of translators is a huge, huge win for Twitter. It means that we can provide translations for all of our users that actually reflect what the standards are in their country or in their language. So if we just localize this or sent this out to a big company to localize our content, we, they might not get all of these social uh, cues that otherwise our translators would know because they live in those countries and they speak those languages and they can talk to each other. So that community is a huge part of it. Uh, and also keeping that community engaged. So we do have a reputation system that measures things like phrase maturity and translator karma. And uh, those reflect how well a translator does in terms of their level. We badge our translators with a special badge on twitter.com. And we also do grant moderator privileges, as I've discussed before. Here's an example of what my profile looks like on twitter.com, or on Translation Center. So I'm at level 18, which is actually BS, because I haven't submitted that many translations. But uh, it's just for illustrative purposes. Uh, and then, of course, it says, you know, other interesting statistics about my activity on the Translation Center. This is my profile on Twitter.com. You might notice the little blue globe next to my name. That is because I'm above level two in the Translation Center, and I've stayed there for a while. That means that I'm now marked as a translator, and you would not believe how people want these badges. They really want this gl blue globe next to their name on Twitter.com. It's this badge of honor for them. So we do try to, to honor that as best we can. So. In, maybe more to the technical side of this. What do we use instead of the i18n gem? We found that using this thing called fast get text is better than get text, obviously faster. Uh, it does still provide multiple backends, in our case, a JSON backend. Uh, it's faster, it's inline, and it is Ruby only though, so we have to do a bunch of other interesting things to, to make this work in other languages. Um, fast get text being just the one for Ruby. The JavaScript one is a big part of this. JavaScript is important because it's just user Twitter like crazy. We have a lot of our dynamic content is rendered with JavaScript. So uh, fast get text provides the underscore function instead of the T function for both Ruby and we also ported that to JavaScript. All the JavaScript one does is it looks up in a hash of JSON. So we have that same JSON hash for both Ruby and JavaScript and that's uh, loaded in and then used uh, just using a hash lookup for each English phrase. So English phrases will give you translated content. It's also pretty fast, it's just a hash lookup, and again, it's in line, and we like that. So just to give you an idea of how easy this JavaScript function is to write, here's what you have, you just have the Twitter object, and then inside of it is the IETN object, and there's a bunch of other things in there too, but the IETN one just contains that hash of uh, English text to translate a text, and you just return the hashed content using the key. And then of course, if the key doesn't exist, return the original string. So you could just, you could, if you use this method, you could just drop this into your own applications, name it something different, and you'd be good to go. We also use a templating system at Twitter called Mustache. And Mustache is wonderful because it does provide us logicless views, means no, you can't inject Ruby code into your templates, uh, which I guess is a, a concern if you're just using ERB. Um, and we actually have ended up patching Mustache to support internationalization. This is a little bit more of the, the technical side. We had to include an i18n node in the, into the source code, uh, but we can now internationalize content in Mustache as well. Here's a couple of examples of how our code looks. So instead of using the t function in ERB, use the underscore function. It's pretty easy. There's the inline string. No more my fancy message with dots, just the actual string. Much easier to read, much easier to understand what's going on, what you're actually saying to the user. There's a JavaScript function, uh, just the same exact concept, underscore function, string in line there. And then here's the mustache example, uh, which is just right there, right there inside your HTML and using those special i tags. So let's look at this process as a flowchart. We have Ruby files, we have JavaScript files, we have mustache files. And they all are converted to JSON using our special script. Man, that is difficult to see. Oh well. Translated using the translation center, they get imported into the translation center, which is the bird with the tilde over the top of him. And once the translated content is finished, out it comes as JSON bundles for each language. Again, hashed from English key to translated text. And then those are fed into the translation or into Twitter.com using that fast get text backend for Ruby and using the JSON hash for, JSON, for uh, JavaScript. Now, 
There's a couple of great things about this system. It's pretty much scalable up to the very end. So developers are going to write Ruby files, they're going to write JavaScript files, they're going to write mustache templates. That's pretty scalable because that's just always going to happen. Then uh, the export to JSON, those files could be pretty large, but we hope that they're doing this incrementally, and so these files are not going to be that large. So they're running a diff between their branch and master. Translation Center is built to be scalable. It uses MySQL in the background. It's running on four servers right now, 24 gigs apiece. It's pretty stable, and uh, it's pretty, pretty scalable, pretty scalable, ready for more content every day. Uh, then they export these big files, which most of this, fortunately, this processing is happening on the back end. So even if these files get huge, it's not going to be a big performance hit. However, that's true for Ruby, it's true for Mustache, that rendering is done server side, but it's not necessarily true for JavaScript, and that's where our scalability breaks down. So what now? You still want to translate text in JavaScript. How are you going to do that? So we take our usual method. This was a, a change that we made uh, a couple months ago, uh, actually more like six months ago, where we were having problems because somebody in uh, India, for example, would have to download this massive like 500K JavaScript translation bundle, and that was just unacceptable. It was taking way too long. A page would take forever to load in Hindi, and we decided, okay, we got to stop this. So using our existing model, using the translation center, using this JSON interchange format, instead, we uh, built into, because we're using Rails 2.3, so nothing quite as fancy as the asset pipeline, but we did have to build, uh, or build this into our asset uh, compiler, which takes these files and actually uses the translations and bakes them directly into the JavaScript, uh, and also into our mustache templates. So we end up having, on the server side, a bunch of already translated files that don't necessarily have all of this, all this overhead of translating, or you know, applying this massive translation bundle to every request. So out comes translation bundles, like I said, and this is gonna be for JavaScript and mustache. Ruby rendering, of course, still happens on the server side. So now, we're much more scalable. We have a much better infrastructure for delivering translations in the browser. So this process works for web apps, for Ruby apps. We also have to support a number of other platforms, including Android. So here's kind of the flow chart for Android. We have, uh, Android only supports this XML format. It uh, uses some XLIF things. It's actually a very specific Android format or XML format. It doesn't follow all the rules. We have to build in some rules to the translation center when it comes to export those files. Uh, and I don't bother telling you it is friggin' annoying, but we finally figured it out. The XML files to JSON again using those tools, and then upload to the translation center, and out comes localized XML files that we can then bundle with the Android software. We do have to support a number of systems, like I said. iPhone is a very interesting case because they use also a proprietary format, .strings. .strings is also basically just a hash mapping English text to translated text. Uh, but the challenge with those is they're encoded with UTF-16 and everything else is UTF-8. So we have to do a conversion step to make sure those still work. Here's XML for Android at UTF-8, JSON on Twitter.com in UTF-8, and also mobile.twitter.com, which is another Rails app, uh, actually still uses YAML files. It's not so good, but that's what they do. So you have to support that YAML format as well. Now you may be saying, this is great. This is awesome. Twitter is so cool. but..." How do I do this for my own applications? Because after all, translating an application is only step one, right? There's a bunch of other things that have to be done to make your app international ready, or globally, global ready. So that's why kind of the second half of this presentation is gonna be talking about internationalizing your own app. How can you bring these features, these ideas, to your own Rails apps? First of all, there's a bunch of things to consider. And I apologize if this is too small. Uh, there's things like dates and times. Currencies, numbers, sorting, collation, abbreviations, even things like colors. In Chinese, for example, it's much more customary to use red to mean good or confirmed than in English where it's much more customary to use green for that. So there's a lot of different considerations. Um, I'll let you kind of internalize this and I'll talk a little bit about um, you know, the support that Ruby has for these things. Unfortunately, at the, at the moment, Rails and Ruby, as far as I know, do not contain great internationalization features, not like the JVM. And so we'll go into how we've decided to solve that problem uh, in just a minute here. Let's go over some best practices though first. So internationalizing an app in any language is challenging. It's not going to take you just a day. It's not going to take you just a month. It'll take a long time to make this work and do it right. 
which is why it's important, again, not to, like DHH said, not to fight the progress, but inter integrate these things into your app and know that you're really doing a good service to the people in the entire world by doing this. Uh, so that's why the first one on here is going to be budget enough time and resources to do this. I can't say that enough. We, Twitter.com and all of our products have not always shared this, this view. We often didn't budget enough time and resources. Developers have come to us and they would say, oh man, we need this feature translated in the next two days. <laughs> like in 28 language, we can't do that. That's just ridiculous. You need to budget enough time and enough resources to get this done right. We also have found that it's much, much better, instead of doing kind of these one-off translation bundle creation steps, to do this as part of the release process. So every time you ship a branch, every time you're about to code review a branch, make sure that you run the tools you need to run to extract your phrases or, or do whatever other internationalization processing you might need. Uh, it's very important also to remain culturally neutral. So if you notice on Twitter.com, the logged out homepage is a picture in India of some people playing cricket. Now that's great for India and the UK, but that doesn't make any sense for people in the United States or pretty much any other country in the world. We did the same thing with, uh, there was one time the royal wedding was featured on Twitter.com homepage. The royal wedding also doesn't really matter to most of the world. And the idea is to always choose images that, and, and other content in your site that doesn't necessarily become um, irrelevant to the people that are accessing your site. That's difficult to do. Also, make sure that you're always thinking globally about the features you're writing. So it's been a long time at Twitter. We finally managed to, to educate our developers so that they always put underscore around the function, around the text that they want to translate. And they just think now, hopefully, and this is a great thing, they think more globally how their products are going to be viewed by the rest of the world. Uh, one interesting statistic is that I think it's something like 65 or 70 percent of all traffic to Twitter.com comes outside of the United States. So our developers really pays to think globally about how we translate things. And depending on the size of your company, it really pays for you to do that same thing. Uh, now, I uh, also am going to advocate this again. Embed strings in your source code. People are probably going to ask me questions at the end of this asking, what the heck are you talking about? Don't do that. It depends on the size of your app. It depends on, you know, if your bundles can be small enough that they can be translated easily. There's a lot of different factors here. I personally prefer to put them in line. That's why there's that star there. You should choose what you want to do yourself. Avoid text and images. This is a huge one. Banner ads do not work in other languages most of the time because they're not translated. They're all static images. Uh, leave enough room for translations. If you speak German or you've ever seen German written, German is much longer generally than English. So is Spanish. So in order to make sure that you're leaving enough room on your page your layout doesn't break, it's a good idea to follow the 65% rule. So say, this is the amount of space I need for English. Increase that by 65%, and that'll handle almost every case. Uh, leave sentences intact. So make sure that you're using smart interpolation, string interpolation, in your views to make sure that you don't have a sentence broken up in the middle so that it doesn't make sense when you translate each of those sections individually. Uh, and for God's sakes, use Unicode. It's a standard. Pick one encoding. Usually UTF-8 is the most popular. But that's one of the reasons why uh, strings files for uh, iPhone are so annoying, because we'd have a different process. They use UTF-16, we use UTF-8. Generally good practice to pick one encoding. Also, it's going to be very important to choose appropriate fonts depending on which language. For example, certain fonts render Chinese characters in a very squash way, and it's difficult to read, so oftentimes you'll want to change a font for a particular language. This is also true of Arabic. I think we use Tahoma instead of Arial instead of Helletica because it just looked more readable. Uh, also, keep your sentences very simple. Translators are great people. They have a great idea of how to translate things, but sometimes even, even complicated or even small, or um, what's the word, even simple sentences can be difficult to translate if you're not following good English grammar rules. Also, don't forget to consider scalability concerns. How are you going to make this process of yours scale to 28 languages, 30 languages, 100 languages? And finally, also, use Ruby 1.9. Ruby 1.9 has much better support for Unicode. It supports Unicode characters in regular expressions. It supports um, more than just UTF-8. So Ruby 1.8 supports UTF-8, um, but doesn't support any other encodings for Unicode. Ruby 1.9 supports more of those. Okay, so how can we handle things like dates, times, numbers, and that kind of thing in our, in our Ruby code? Well, I'll tell you how Java does it, and this is going to be pretty hard to see. 
but Java has great support for internationalization, not just localization, internationalization. So just to go over this briefly, here's a Java, some Java code. This is, I think, uh, Java 7. Essentially, they are using this code fr underscore fr, which is the French locale in France. And then here's a date, and they create an instance of date formatter, and then they say date format format today, which is the date that they chose. And they print that out, and it could be something like 16, I don't know how to pronounce this, June 2012. And that is the French way of saying June 16th, 2012, which is awesome. That's wonderful. You don't have to do any kind of lookups. It's all right there in the language for you. Here's a similar way to translate a number. For some languages, the comma and the period are interchanged. So instead of for the thousand separator, we would use a comma in English, and in other languages, they use a period. So this is a great way to make sure that your numbers are also translated right. Yes, go JVM. Lots of great support there. One last one, this is how you might collate something, collate being sorting something. In this example, we're just translating or collating uh, a list of strings, first, manana, man, many, maxi, and next. And if you use the standard Java sort function, and this is also true in Ruby, you're gonna get first, man, many, maxi, manana, and next because the enya character in Spanish actually comes after the X uh, in ASCII and also in UTF-8. So if you use a collator that is more suited for your language, in this case I chose uh, Mexican Spanish, it'll actually put the manana, the N with the tilde over the top, it'll put that character ahead of the X, which is correct for Spanish. A bunch of other examples of this in Swedish, for example, the O with two dots over the top is actually last in the list, and things like that. And this, again, I don't speak these languages, I just have you know, seen these examples online. So you want to be able to do that kind of thing in Ruby, too. But as it turns out, there really are not that many great internationalization libraries for Ruby. And, uh, you know, that, that makes me kind of look like this guy. Why? What's going on? Ruby, why do you not have great internationalization support like Java? Come on. So to fix that problem, to kind of remedy that and maybe give back to our wonderful Ruby community, which is made up of all you guys, we decided to make something called Twitter CLDR. Twitter CLDR is... Uh, internationalization library for Ruby. It's a Ruby gem. Yeah, the CLDR stands for the Common Locale Data Repository, which is available. It's published by the Unicode Consortium. It's, uh, for that reason, high quality, and you can get the files for free. Twitter CLDR, using this data published by Unicode, we're able to support uh, dates and times, numbers, sorting, everything in green that you see on the, on the left-hand side here. And we hope at some point to also support addresses and phone numbers. And then there are a couple things that are outside the scope of Ruby CLDR, or Twitter CLDR. Uh, tokenization and searching, for example, stemming, any cultural cues, of course, are much diff more difficult to program uh, than just having somebody know these and build them into your code. Uh, character encodings, of course, that's up to you to choose. Uh, text direction, right to left, left to right, colors, URLs, and CAPTCHAs, and those things are all things that you should be aware of, but definitely are not supported, generally speaking, by Java or hopefully or uh, by anybody who uses CLDR because that data just is too difficult to program, to, to include in a machine readable way. So let's give an example of how we might internationalize a date using Twitter CLDR. So Java, you notice, is pretty verbose, and Ruby is known for being succinct and easy to read, so you might do something like this instead. We extend core Ruby objects and give them the localize function. So you simply say, like, get a date time, call dot localize on it, pass in the locale that you want to translate it into, and then just call 2s on it, and you get back the date formatted, in this case, for Spanish. You can also, here's an example in Hungarian. I'm gonna give you back this perfectly, this nicely formatted string. In this case, it's also including uh, the uh, time zone in the UTC offset because we called full s on it. And there's a bunch of other uh, functions that we can call on this that give you different kinds of formats. Here's the Japanese example. This one's kind of my favorite because it looks so cool. And if anybody in the audience speaks Japanese, hopefully that's correct. <laughs> uh, but again, just calling that two full S, there's also two medium S and uh, two short S. You want to get shorter ones. And essentially what this is doing in the background is just creating an instance of localized date time. And you're passing in a date time and a language to translate it into. Uh, one interesting feature of this is if you don't pass in a locale, it'll default to English. Uh, it'll also use, if it's available, it'll use the fast get text locale which, of course, is, again, the one we, what, you, what we use at Twitter, and so it made sense to provide that as a default. 
Here's a way to do numbers. Again, just calling the localized function on a number, passing in a locale, calling 2s. Very short, very succinct, and you get out exactly the kind of number that you were hoping for. Here's another example with precision. So you can specify how many uh, significant digits you want at the end of that to the 2s function. And this is again just calling or creating an instance of localized number in the background. Um, we also have support for currencies at the moment. So here's a currency. This is going to be formatted in euros. It puts the currency symbol right at the beginning. You can translate these or localize uh, numbers like this, not just with the country code, but also the currency codes. Either one of those will work. And in this case, we're translating this number into uh, Peruvian nuevo soles, and that uses the slash, or the s slash dot, and that's why that's at the beginning there. The uh, the currency system we have in place also lets you get data for different currencies. So in this case, it's showing you how to uh, get currency information for a particular country code. Peru again here, and notice that if I pass in the name of the country, it gives me the code, currencies, and uh, the symbol. And if I pass in the country, uh, the, the uh, currency code, it gives me out uh, the currency symbol and also then the country. So it's just the opposite uh, of the one above. Another really challenging and interesting problem that we deal with in internationalization all the time is how to pluralize something. And Twitter CLDR is eventually going to support plurals. This is kind of a, a preview of what we hope to include. One of our Google Summer of Code uh, per people is working on this right now. We uh, have a string like this in English, and you want to say there are four horses in the barn. You want to say there is one horse in the barn. Notice that is and are change there depending on the number of horses in your barn. So this is only one of the two ways you can internationalize uh, plurals. Notice that we're just passing in horse count there, which is three, and then we have options for one and other. And uh, Twitter CLDR lets you pass in a number um, as part of horse count there, and then it looks up which rule applies to your language. If you're in Russian, for example, you'd have more than just one another. You might have one few and other, because Russia has three or four, actually, plural rules. Uh, and these are going to be dynamically replaced. It tries to follow the same interpolation syntax in 1.8 and 1.9, including throwing a key error if uh, the translation isn't found or if, if the plural isn't found, because that's what Ruby 1.9 does. So you Ruby 1.8 folks out there will feel at home with this as well. Now, the problem with this is that it works, but it doesn't necessarily provide these translation in line. It must be pretty difficult for the programmer and for the translator to look at these individual phrases. And actually, I. <laughs> I forgot to underscore these other ones. So one in this hash here should have an underscore function around it as well. Uh, and so should this string. So how do we fix this? How do we make it so that it's easy for a translator to translate this? So instead of translating something like one horse, which makes no sense, or is one horse, they instead translate the entire thing in line and they can see every plural rule at the same time. The idea here is that instead of using that syntax, we have a different way of doing this, which would be to embed this kind of JSON-like object into your string. So we have this kind of special syntax, percent, and then uh, less than and greater than signs, and you pass in horse count here, uh, one other, and that's all encapsulated in those less than and greater than signs, and then you can just use the interpolation syntax with horse count there. And that's easy for the translator to translate. For example, in Russian, you might get this. So this is great. How do I get it, you're asking? You can always go to GitHub. Twitter, Twitter CLDR dash RB. Um, and you can also just install the gem, gem install Twitter CLDR. And that's an underscore, not a dash, my bad. So for future plans, immediate future, Twitter CLDR hopes to support normalization, sorting, some capitalization, abbreviation stuff, uh, the ability to quote strings using the quote marker for your language. And we also expect to support a JavaScript version in the near future. Uh, JavaScript does have a little bit of support for things like dates. You can call dot two localized date string, I believe, on JavaScript dates. Uh, but it's nice to have this to be, you know, kind of the same format across your stack, so JavaScript and Ruby. Uh, I'd like to give some special thanks to some people who wrote code because we're really standing on the shoulders of giants with this gem. Um, so there's some special thanks, shout outs to give. Uh, this is the Ruby CLDR gem by Sven Fuchs. I think that's how you pronounce his name. He is, uh, just an internationalization guru, has been in the Ruby community for a while. Uh, Ruby CLDR, though, provides these great formatters. It provides a way of transforming the raw CLDR data into YAML files that we can use. 
Uh, however, it doesn't really, it provides formatters as well, but you have to construct these formatters in a very specific way, and it's not very easy to use. You wouldn't be able to just call localize, for example, on a string or on a date. But he definitely laid the groundwork that we're building off of. There's also the Unicode gem. Unicode gem is essentially a, um, a decomposition library for, UT or for Unicode. You can pass in a string, it'll give you back the normalized string. It's a, it uses a bunch of native extensions though, which is why we decided not to use its functionality. We want to be able to run these internationalization uh, functions on any system, including ones that may use JRuby. Uh, although a coworker pointed out to me that if you're using JRuby, you already have access to all this great Java functionality. Uh, but it's still, it's nice to be able to run everywhere without having to compile something. Finally, the uh, ICU for R gem is also great. Uh, it's very cool, very complete. It uses the, uh, it's just a wrapper around the library that you can install that's published by IDM called ICU or International Conventions for Unicode, I believe. Uh, again, though, that's not necessarily platform independent. You need to install that on your system before you can use Twitter CLDR if we decided to build that in. So that's why we decided to build our own gem and not focus or use all the capabilities from these other ones. But it's still nice to know these exist. Okay, so now that we've gone over internationalizing your app, I think it'd be fun to go over some stories. So Twitter has a number of interesting and sometimes sad, sometimes awesome internationalization stories. Uh, for example, in Chinese, the word you can be very contentious. There's a good three or four ways to say you, apparently, and our community really struggled over which one to use. There was even a couple of moderators that ended up leaving the program because they just disagreed with the version of you that we ended up choosing. Uh, Indonesian is also a very interesting case study. In Indonesian, we had trouble with the SMS commands. In SMS, you would simply say unfollow or follow at user. Unfollow and follow, the words that were chosen in Indonesian also can mean live and kill. So if you say kill at user, it's not very friendly. I mentioned German before. Here's an interesting example of a German word uh, for cheese. So in English, we might say cheese. We might say, you know, cheese rolled in mountain herbs. But in, in German, they say this enormous thing with all these extra adjectives stacked on the end of their nouns. Here's another great example. This is the rank insignia on a river captain's hat. It goes off the slide. It's just too much. Here's an example of when the layout on Twitter.com was broken because of this. So in English, this would just say, don't forget, we also can, you can take these apps with you. This is when you log out. Take these apps with you, or you can use your SMS, uh, SMS on your smartphone or on your regular phone. And uh, of course, that fit on one line for English, but for, Eng for German, it had broke the layout and was on two lines. And it's really difficult to see here, too. But underneath that example, there's also a couple of angle brackets that ended up wrapping to the next line and just looks super ugly. So this is, again, why we want to use that 65% rule. Farsi was another really interesting case study. So in Farsi, there was a couple of our moderators who uh, weren't really allowed to use Twitter or translate or help us translate Twitter into other languages, uh, especially Farsi because this person was in Iran and we had to make sure we didn't badge him <clears throat> on the translation center uh, or in Twitter.com and uh, he, could have, he could have been killed if they if they'd found out. So that just kind of shows how dedicated our volunteers are and just how delicate sometimes the situation can be. Uh, my personal favorite though has to be Italian. So when Twitter was first translated into Italian, it uh, the, the, the first homepage you would see says, follow your interests. In Italian, though, for certain reasons, like uh, the same thing is true in French, the word for follow can also be, uh, the native word for follow, that is, can also mean to stalk, and it's very negative, and so they decided to change it to something else, and what came out in Italian was, succumb to your urges. <laughs> also, <laughs> not quite the message we were hoping for. All right, and that pretty much concludes this talk, but I'd like to invite you to ask any questions. I don't know how we work with the microphone on that. Uh, maybe I can just repeat the question. Oh, and bonus points if you can tell me what each of these, word, uh, these, uh, these languages are here on the screen. Yeah. I tell you the languages. Go for it. The first one is Korean, the next one is Arabic, the third one may be German, the, the fourth one is either Spanish or Portuguese, the fifth one is Hindi, the, third, uh, the sixth one is English and the seventh is Japanese. Very nice. That's almost exactly right. Okay, so I believe, so yes, you were right about the Japanese, or uh, all of them up to uh, preguntas, which is either you said Spanish or Portuguese. It's actually Portuguese. Very nice. And then questions, looks like it's English, but it's actually French. So the same in both languages. So you, you get 99%. 
Thank you guys all for coming. Really appreciate it. Get to translating.